In today's episode, the Blue Jays finally become a contender, the Knicks are undefeated, it's Miggy for MVP, all that and more including our NFL picks up next, you're watching The Pitch. Welcome to The Pitch. As always, I'm your host John Fox alongside here with Mitch Sabatelli and Mike Papsperoni. Now, first story of the day, Miami Marlins and Toronto Blue Jays pull off a blockbuster deal. Thoughts on it? What's another, the deal? Another fire sale for Miami. Miami pulls off this huge trade similar to what the Red Sox did with the Dodgers, sending Jose Reyes, Josh Johnson, Mark Burley, John Buck, as well as Emilio Bonifacio to the Blue Jays for basically Henderson Alvarez and another couple of prospects to go with it. Look, I think it's a great deal for both sides. You know, Miami wasn't going to be good for the next couple of years. They already unloaded Hanley Ramirez, who wasn't happy there, and then Heath Bell, who was a disappointment. Now they can get all that money off the books and start new again. The only problem is, I mean, they can take all these new prospects and start to grow. The only problem is, I mean, this Miami fan franchise was all happy with their new stadium. You know, they got their new logo, short new lives. team. Very they got all lives. these new players. And now, I mean, all these players are all pissed now. You see Giancarlo Stanton, who just sent out a tweet. He said, all right, man, I'm pissed. And then Bryce Harper comes back and says, hey, why don't you join the Nats, bro? And then he goes, oh, if only my last name backwards was it not Nats. Yeah. <laughs> and then so, I mean, that, got, that was a huge tweet this week. I thought that was a good one. Uh, but as you can see, the Marlins are all pissed. I, I, I would be pissed if I'm a Marlins fan as well. I'd be very pissed too because you can get all the hype for this new team and then the team, after the team just goes away to right. another team. It, yeah, you're right, it's like the Red Sox. to set up for the birth of a great team and no. That's Especially not, if what, you're, that's not what happened. If yeah. you're a small market, uh, unlike the Red Sox, I mean the Red Sox can build with money already out there with Mike Napoli and stuff. But that's, that's what the, the Marlins, Marlins are trying I mean, to do. Tough. The Marlins are going to be doing that. But right. I mean, first it was get rid of the the main cancer in Nazi Guillen, like saluting Cuba and everything. And, <laughs> and, and Hanley Yeah, and Hanley Ramirez and everyone else. It's just, it's a very good deal for the Blue Jays. And already, like, up and coming competitive AL East. And now the Blue Jays, who were like the bottom team with the Red Sox last year, just coming right up. And I mean, I think they'll be right in there. I just, it's a very good deal for both sides because Miami can rebuild and finally get that new team to where it needs to be and bring everybody in. Fresh start with the new stadium and everything. That's probably what they were thinking. And honestly, just very good deal for the Blue Jays. And they definitely got the Red Sox right now. Red Sox are looking like last place right now. Right. I mean, right now on paper, I mean, it's going to change a little bit. We're too early in the offseason here. But right now, I put the Red Sox right in the cellar of the division. Yeah. I think the Orioles are there as well, but you know they had a great year last year, and they're only going to get better in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, with that Blue Jays lineup, they can throw in a lineup of Jose Reyes, who two years ago a lot of people were saying that was the best player in the game. That's why he got that contract. Then you could throw Bonifacio in there, who before he got hurt was leading the league in steals. Edwin Encarnacion, who had, came from nowhere and put up huge home run numbers. Then Jose Batista, Adam Lynn, go down the go down the line here with Aaron Sebia. That's a real, real good team and for just the Blue Jays. I mean, right now I think they're like the third best team in the AL East right now yeah. on paper behind the Yankees and Rays. All right, well, staying on the Blue Jays right now, they take a gamble. They pick up Melky Cabrera. Right. Thoughts on this? I think that's only going to help them. That's another big-time player up and coming, came to New York, went to San Fran, had the problems with the drug issues there, the 50-game ban. I think it's a good new start for him with the team that's already coming in with stacked people coming on that side. I think it's only going to help to the firepower that the Blue Jays have, and it's just going to help even more for them. Right, you know, I mean, Melky Cabrera was leading the league, leading the NL at least, in batting average by the, before he got caught with performance-enhancing drugs. I mean, this guy came from nowhere. Maybe it was the drugs that was helping him out, but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, he, 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 he was coming alive nice. here with his hitting. Uh, his swing was getting better. He yeah. changed his stance a little bit. I think it's a good move for the Blue Jays. Take a gamble two years. I think it's $8 million a year. Not too bad in this day and age for $8 million for a player who was going to lead the league in average before he got caught. So, I mean, take the gamble. It's only two years. It's not like it's a big contract. I mean, throw him out there. You can bat him second. You can bat him down at the end of the order. Maybe he pulls out another miraculous, miraculous year, and maybe it's a good contract for them. I like this move. I think it's a risk-taking move, but especially yeah. right after this big trade. I think it's a great move for Toronto. And then yeah, I think it will help them. It will only help them at this point, though. All right, moving on. Now, if the season started today, if the season started right today, who would be your favorite in the East? 
I'm going to go for AL East. I'm going to go with the Yankees again. You know, I mean, they're get, everyone's saying that they're getting old, but I mean, that lineup is too deep right now. And now you got to get that rotation. You're going to get Michael Pineda, who nobody even saw last year. They traded Jesus Montero for this guy, who was the, their big prospect. He goes to the Mariners, and then they get Michael Pineda, who got hurt for the whole season. Uh, that guy's going to come to his own and make a real good one, too, with him and CeCe Sabathia. The Yankees, are you know they're going to counter what the Blue Jays just did here. The Red Sox aren't going to let this go. But uh, you know with the Yankees, when they they got a short window here. they got a short window with A-Rod, Jeter, Teixeira. They're going to do whatever they can these next couple of years. I expect them to make huge plays on some of these players and maybe go out and make a trade as well. I'd like the Yankees and the Elias again. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, especially with Joe Girardi backing them up and everything. He knows everyone. It's just a, it's just a good system over there. It's always been and just is going to keep being that way. And you, Unless someone really knocks them down, which hasn't happened for the AL East in a right. while, then the Yankees are just going to... Stay and also, you yeah, can I don't see them moving anywhere. Yeah. And also, you can say what you want about those that Blue Jays lineup. I mean, that rotation. Who knows about Josh Johnson and Mark Burley pitching in the AL East? It's going to be tough. Yeah, Mark Burley has experience with the Chicago oh, in the Central, but Josh Johnson. I mean, he's had injury problems. He's never really picked pitched in big, big ballparks like Yankee Stadium, like Fenway Park. Now he comes over to Toronto. It's going to be tough. Him, Ricky Ramiro, and Mark Burley, yeah, it's decent on paper, but it's not going to stack up against the other rotations right there with, like, Verlander, or you go yeah. down with the Rangers. It's going to be tough for i got to give them props for a great move, though, doing everything that the Red Sox aren't. Absolutely. So. All right, moving on, final topic um, in our ML MLB section. Uh, Miguel Cabrera wins the uh, MVP over Mike Trout. Now, who wants to take this first? Do you think that was the right call? Well, take take that first. I think yeah. it's a travesty to even put Mike Trout in the same discussion <laughs> as Miguel Cabrera. And a lot of people, you can make laugh, a lot of people are saying that this guy should have won single-handedly. Look, Miguel Cabrera was triple crown aside, the first triple crown in 45 years since Carl Yastrzemski. I don't care if what team you're on. If you win the triple crown, you should automatically win the MVP. And that's the only thing. My whole thing is if you make the playoffs, you have to make the playoffs in order to be even in the MVP race. And it's not like Miguel Cabrera was not in the playoffs. He carried his team to the playoffs along with Prince Fielder and also to the World Series. I know you leave playoffs out of it, but I'm going to at least make at least make me into the playoffs that counts towards it. Yeah, Mike Trout nice. and the Angels with that huge entire, with all that payroll, with Albert Pujols, everybody coming in here, C.J. Wilson, they didn't even make the playoffs. Yeah, they got better once Mike Trout got called up, and yeah, he had the, the best wins above replacement since Sammy Sosa in 10 years, but, I mean, 139 games, he was great, and yeah, give him the rookie year, but this guy's literally my age, and he's, gonna, he's only 20, he's going to have a whole shelf worth of MVPs in his lifetime, Miguel Cabrera, this was his year, anytime you win the Triple Crown, anytime you get your team to the Playoffs World Series, you've got to give this guy the, the MVP, and, my, and also, everybody's just taking those stats, home runs, RBIs, average, also, Miguel Cabrera won, led the league in OPS, on-base plus slugging. So that's getting on base and driving the ball. In that huge pitcher's ballpark in Comerica, I really think that my, Miguel Cabrera should have won this in a landslide like he did. And Mike Trout, you, you can say that about his fielding too, but, I mean, fielding's not going to stack up. Miguel Cabrera played third base, and yeah, everyone can say, oh, he has bad defense at third base. But it's because they had Prince Fielder, and they asked him, hey, we need you to play third base. And I think he did a pretty good job. But they won him for his bat, not his defense. I'm going to give Miguel Cabrera the MVP. I can't agree with you more. I pretty much put out this exact same argument. I think, I, don't get me wrong, we're not going to take anything away from Mike Trout. He's a great young ball player. Like you say, he's going to have a crap load of MVPs coming up in his future and everything. He's going to be a great ball player, arguably could be the Hall of Fame or whatever and everything. But... The thing is, Miguel Cabrera, you're right, this is his year. He's come so far. I mean, he's, he was like this overweight dude who was just like lost like 30 pounds. And they were like, oh, we're not sure because of the weight if he's going to be able to do all this and all the questions about Cabrera and like not being able to be mobile and everything. And really, he just pretty much just shut everybody up with the Triple Crown. Something that has been done 45 years since he has did it. It's just unbelievable. You can't not give him the MVP for that. Like, right. It's like the top honor. And it's like the one thing you can't even argue against. So when I saw 75% to 25% and I turned on my TV today and there were like people, sports writers, all the sports writers being little bitches complaining like, Oh, Mike Trout, uh, this is a travesty. Oh, Mike Trout, to not say that he shouldn't get more percentage is unfair. It's like, the, dude, the guy had the triple crown. He right. beat him in average homers and RBIs. Every aspect of it, he, made, he brought his team to the World Series, regardless if they got, if they got swept or not. I mean, which they did, but regardless if they got swept. 
But he brought them to the World Series at a hell of a year. Mike Trout's team, like you said with the payroll, didn't even make the playoffs. And, I mean, he's going to be a great player, but this is Cabrera's time and he very much deserved MVP. And it should have been, like, 99 to 1%. And I want to say one thing before we move on. Paps, I'm going to give you tons of shout-outs for those uh, picks you had with the Falcons coming nice. up here. The Falcons lost, but... Rewind the tape. I actually took Buster Posey to win the NL MVP, and he took that honor uh, home. Uh, comeback player of the year. Great, great year for Buster Posey. And to go along with my Giants and Tigers prediction, oh, yeah. well, I also picked Adrian Gonzalez as the MVP of the AL. Uh, no comment on that. But sorry, I mean, I have to take a... I <laughs> yeah, he take, wasn't even in the AL, yeah, but yeah, yeah, he, I, he, I, he, I, I did pick Buster Posey, so I got to counter your, your picks there with that, with that That's applause. That's a loss every time. Props to you. <laughs> All right, now moving on to our last top story of the day, NBA. The Knicks are 6-0. and oh. Thoughts on this? I think it's... I think it's just great for the Knicks and Mike Woodson coming in there. They had D'Antoni with Win the now, high offense. Win now, lose later. Exactly. They had the high <laughs> offense and everything going. But they never had much much defense. I mean, Mike Woodson coming in, I think that's going to be an issue yeah, for them. No They're going to be, this is even more issues yeah. going to be over there with everyone with the offense. And But, I mean, it's just a great thing for them. Carmelo Anthony really coming into his own, leading his team right now. I know it's only six games, but points, rebounds, and blocks per game. Mm -hmm. Just having a great year. He's got Felton behind him with Chandler. He's finally got the big man who's consistent, can get points, boards, everything. And, I mean, it's just the defensive stack that you need in there to help Melo so he can do his job so then this team can flourish, which they're doing now. And I think the head coach is a big part of that, too. Right, and it's way too early, obviously. I mean, it's only six games into the season. But what Pep said with Carmelo Anthony, he's playing not even in his primary position. Usually he's a small forward. Uh, with the, uh, this whole thing has been without Amari Stoudemire, arguably one of the best players these last yeah. couple of years. So they, Mike Woodson asked Carmelo, Carmelo to play the four and play the power forward. And he's doing that tremendously, leading the league. I mean, leading oh, the yeah. team, like Pep said, in rebounds. And this is huge for Carmelo and huge for Carmelo's confidence. You know, Jeremy Lin took away from that a little bit last year. You know, this is back. This is his team. I think the Knicks did the right move by shipping Jeremy Lin out there, bringing Raymond Be Felton back, which worked. You also get Jason Kidd, the established veteran over there, who can play the shooting guard now that he's a little older, as well as backup Michael, uh, Raymond Felton in the point guard. Yeah. You can also get, throw in Ronnie Brewer, who's doing a great job. And Tyson Chandler is playing again. Playing another uh, All Star caliber year right now. These first six games. Smith off and, the bench too. Right, it's Smith, Jr. Smith, and getting a team. little electricity off the bench. Now, listen, I don't even think that you got the Nick, you got the Nets in there, you got the Celtics. I don't even think that you can make the case that the that New York is the best team, even in their own division. But for right now, they're leading the league, and they're leading the East, and setting the pace in that conference. I yeah. think they're doing a great, great job. And I think guys like Jason Kidd really got to set the tone there, really establish some veteran leadership for these young guys. Yeah. It seems like the Knicks huge. were in the cellar like four or five years ago, and then they just kept rebuilding, building up, building up, building up. I think this I think this year, if not this year, the next year, it's one gonna, of these years is going to be their year to just make it to like the Eastern Conference Finals and finally just get past that first round. That it's going to be interesting in this Chemistry once Amari Stoudemire gets back as well. Yeah, yeah, that too. All right, moving on to NHL. Okay, moving on to the NFL. <laughs> uh, NFL news yeah, here. News, news. Uh, Big Ben and Cutler both injured now. Thoughts on the team's chances now? Now, exactly what is Big Ben's injury? Um, I think it's a dislocated producer. What is it? Dislocated rib. Dislocated it's rib. And he actually had a press though. conference about how severe his injury was, which is a little, I mean, just let it go. Just maybe put something out there and say, oh, <laughs> dislocated <laughs> rib. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so all of a sudden, insert Byron left, which he's back into the league just when yeah, he was the, out the, of it. The, the thing is with the Steelers, like, no matter if Big Ben gets hurt, suspended for, you know, uh, whatever, yeah. um, the, the Steelers <laughs> just always seem to just be there anyways. Like, right. Know, it's whether they, yeah. You know, whether if they throw Charlie Batch out there, Byron Leftwich, you know, yeah. you know, we'll take it. They'll, they'll, they'll be there. Exactly. And then Big Ben returns, and then he finishes the job. All of a sudden, yeah. this is going to go back to Dick LeBeau, who's the best defensive coordinator in the game right now. It's going to go back to Mike Tomlin. Now, listen, they're going to have to run run heavily now without the passing game. They're going to take their deep shots, San Antonio Brown and Mike Wallace all day. But, you know, they've had problems in the backfield with Hall, Redmond. Redmond's back. I think he's starting this week. I think it was huge this week if Redmond can possibly put up a good game against the Baltimore defense, which is going to be tough. But, you know, anytime you got Leftwich in there, that's a huge, huge loss going from Big Ben, two-time two Super Bowl champion, and you throw this guy who can't do anything. It's going to be a tough, tough loss for them. I think this is going to hurt for a while, and I guess he's going to be out for a while. Cutler, I don't think is as severe, but this is almost as, 
as big a loss. Like I mentioned in just the last week, I said the Bears are the best team, but I feel like they're going to have an injury like they always do, and bam, right that week, Jay Cutler gets hurt again. And Jay Cutler needs to, as soon as he gets back to the field, he needs to lead his team, he needs to stay on the field, and they can really do damage. As soon as he leaves, they lose. I think Big Ben being gone is way bigger than having Jay Cutler gone. Right, right? obviously. Just, obviously, but the Bears, I mean, you say they're the best, though. I don't really. I can't, I no, I said when they're all healthy, oh, they're, they're right healthy. there. They're, yeah, they're there, but I, I clearly I just don't think they're the best mm -hmm. team when they're healthy. I just I don't think it's going to be as big of a loss to lose Jay Cutler. I think that Bears defense can really carry them like they have been throughout this whole entire season, pretty much. And I mean, who, who's at backup? Like, who's going to be coming in for them? It's going to be a bunch of new guys. I don't know who they actually Still, I mean, as long as they can just run with Forte and everything and maybe do like the play, get the play action going and get some wide open balls down deep, whatever, then I think they could pull it off. And But it's just it's just a big loss for the Steelers because the team that's trying to catch the Ravens and trying to get in the playoff spot with Luck and all those other teams chasing them, it's just going to hurt them even more in their chances. Even though they're there, I think... This could be their falling off point in the divisional right. race and the playoff race in general for them. I think and, that really hurts. And this really hurts the J, um, the, the Bears in their division with the with the Vikings, with the yeah. Packers, with the Lions. I mean, Packers are going to all of a sudden pounce on this. And they were really just establishing the chemistry between Brandon Marshall and Jay Cutler. And now, like I said, Jay Cutler, when healthy, he's actually a decent quarterback. He's doing real well this year. All of a sudden, out of the picture, this is going to really hurt. Yeah, but the Bears yeah. can they can they can afford to lose some games. Few, yeah, yeah. The, the with, Steelers can with Big Ben's, you know, right. with Big Ben and the Steelers' horrible yeah, start this season. Yeah. I mean, that's hurt. that's going to be really tough. Push a lot. All right, moving on to games of the week. First game here: Bears at the 49ers. Now so that's going right into that this. is that is a for the first you know for the game of the week yeah. like saying that for the first game out of the three that's both that's quarterbacks something. banged up Jay Keller Alex Smith both banged up but the, I think the fact is the 49ers just tied a game with the Rams for the first time in what I think it's like five years or so yeah. and with, and I mean I think they're gonna have to come back with the vengeance here I think the 49ers are gonna play at Candlestick here I think especially with the Bears without Cutler I think this is gonna be a big big win for the 49ers I think it's a battle of defenses right here. But, you know, I think the home field advantage is huge in this one. If this was a soldier field, I think it might be a different story. I think the home field advantage is going to really help the 49ers. They need a bounce back win here. And I think they're going to pull it out in a defensive battle. I'm going to see 17 points in I think the biggest thing here is the home field advantage, like you said, because Candlestick Park, it's loud, it's crazy atmosphere. And I just think the Bears are going to go in without Cutler, and they're going to have a big, big trouble. They're going to be in big, big trouble there. I just think the defense will play as good as always, but... I think it'll come down to it'll be a low scoring game. I just I just don't see the Bears pulling it out after that tough loss last week and then losing the quarterback too. I hear. All right. So I think 49ers got it. 49ers. All right. Moving on to the second game of the week. Indianapolis at New England. Both teams six and three. Yeah. And we mentioned this last week with the whole Andrew Locker, Tom Brady comparison, and then we're right into this one. These we've got three good games here. And uh, you know, both six and three, like like John just said. I mean, this is a huge, huge game. I'm going to go with the Patriots, though. I think they're going to, um, after this bye and after this win, it was a tight win against the Bills. They just squeaked out there. I think they're going to have to have a bounce back and actually win a big game against Andrew Luck and the Colts. I think they're going to do it actually pretty easily in this one. I think it's going to be an offensive battle. I think Andrew Luck I get going against in this big game. I think he hasn't been completely tested in huge, huge games. Well, now that'll test him. Right. With this, new, and with this new rivalry oh, yeah. and, you know, the whole rivalry with Brady and Peyton, that's going to be the spotlight on Andrew Locke. Maybe show up Peyton here. I think Tom Brady's going to show him up in because of experience. I'm going to say the Patriots win this one. I'm going to agree with the Patriots with their prediction also. Six and three, they need a big win. As you, if you can recall, last season they were five and three. I'm pretty sure what, they win eight straight games to get to the Super Bowl or whatever. And, I mean, I just, I think they're going to do it again. I think they're going to win so another at game. Gillette, right so. And at Gillette, yeah, obviously. But uh, I think luck, I don't think they'll do as bad as you seem, you make it seem like. I don't think they're going to do as bad. No, I don't think they're going to I, I uh, think, I think it's going to be a close game. It's a week, it's a week past secondary. you got Tlaib back in there who's been oh, yeah. there for a couple weeks now yeah. after the suspension. But I think I think luck's going to do a pretty good game. I just think Tom Brady's going to have a better game. I agree, yeah. I think it's just going to be the quarterback one up and the other quarterback. Sure. All right, well, hopefully there's no luck uh, at Gillette Stadium. So. <laughs> Moving on to our final game of the week, Baltimore at Pittsburgh. Take it. 
you know, this is at Pittsburgh, but anytime you got Byron Leftwich out there, I got to give it the edge to the other team. I'm going to go Baltimore. I think Pittsburgh needs this win more, especially at losing Big Ben. And it's at their field. The fans are going to probably help this team out, but I think it's going to be too tough. I think Joe Flacco is going to try to do his best to really take the spotlight in here and try to go deep to Torrey Smith a few times. Maybe hit Torrey Smith in a couple deep routes, I think, in this game. Uh, really attack that secondary. And also, you got Anquan Bolden back there. Ray Rice, it's a tough matchup for the Steelers. Yeah. They both seen each other. All of a sudden, it's a huge rivalry, but I'm going to go with the Ravens just because of the new news with Big Ben. Yeah, that's I mean, even if, yeah, I gotta agree with you on that. With the new news of Big Ben, also I think even if Big Ben was in, I'd still take the Ravens because I think the Ravens are one of the arguably the most dominant team in the AFC. Uh, they have so many weapons. Their defense is great. They, they struggled for a couple but, games there, but they bad. did. But I mean, they just they're just a proven solid team throughout. You know, you don't really see should a lot. Should be of seven. That. Uh, should be. I don't know. So they should be they're seven two now. Yeah, they're seven. Yeah. I just think the Ravens have too many weapons. I think the defense is going to outmatch them. I think they're going to pull a big big win out in the row, and Joe Flacco is going to prove it through. Sure. They think they're going to win. All right, well, that about wraps it up for this episode of The Pitch. I mean, unless any of you guys have anything else to share. Anything no more Fusas cakes. Oh, ah, yeah, true. NHL is <laughs> a start, man. Yes, it's ridiculous. All right, well, until next week, I'm your host, Sean Fox, alongside here with Mitch Sabatelli and Mike Pepsperoni. See you next week.